One of the first things that intelligent design argues is that it is necessary to explain what we see in the fossil record, that the fossil record is a problem of one sort for evolution. You might hear people say that the fossil record doesn't support evolution. Well, the National Academy of Sciences only a few years ago basically said, look, there are so many intermediate forms between all these species that it's often difficult to identify categorically where the transition occurs from one species to another. In other words, there's so many transitional forms, we actually argue about this. Christine Janis, a friend of mine at Brown, who's a paleontologist, um, I once asked Christine, you know, what about this uh, business of no transitional forms? And she said, are you kidding? I just came back from a meeting where there were 11 or 12 new fossils from the Powder River Basin in Wyoming were being introduced, and almost fistfights broke out among the scientists arguing as to whether or not these fossils should be called mammal-like reptiles or reptile-like mammals. <laughs> if, people are, if paleontologists are willing to argue about that, it tells you two things. One is paleontologists will argue about anything. <laughs> and the second thing that it will tell you is that there are innumerable intermediate and transitional forms that we see in the fossil record. But I want to go a little bit further th than this. Um, one of the arguments that has often been made against evolution is that the fossil record doesn't have the intermediates that it ought to. For example, we've known for a long time that whales and dolphins evolved from terrestrial mammals. There are unmistakable marks in their genetics and in their skeleton of this. But critics of evolution have said, oh yeah? Well, you know, if they did, where are the intermediate forms? You know, put up or shut up. And in fact, I've even seen cartoons that looked a bit like this, ridiculing the notion that an intermediate could even exist between a land mammal and a swimming mammal, and the argument is that such animals would be so awkward on the land and so poor at swimming in the water that they really wouldn't be survivable. Well, the cartoons and the arguments started to disappear about 10 or 12 years ago when the very first skeletons of exactly such creatures were dug up. This is the skeleton of an organism which is now called Ambulocetus natans. And if your Latin is good, you'll know that Ambulocetus means the walking whale and natans means who swims. This is the walking whale who swims. It is a perfect intermediate form to plug right in the middle. So you might say, do we now have a true intermediate form? Not really. As it turns out, we have five intermediate forms that fill this gap, all discovered within the last two decades, precisely because paleontologists, when they found this guy, they figured out we know where to look. And where to look is in the Indus River Valley between India and Pakistan. That's where these creatures evolved, and that's where more intermediate fossils are found all the time. Okay, so do evolutionists say, yay, we've solved the problem, evolution is true, Darwin was right? No. Science is enormously self-critical. If this really happened, if this is a genuine evolutionary series, do you know what has to have happened along with it? The middle ear has to have been completely changed. And the reason for that is the middle ear that a land mammal, like us, has is very good for hearing in the air. If any of you have scuba dived or snorkeled, you know that your hearing stinks underwater. Your hearing is lousy. But the underwater hearing of these guys is sensational. It's so good they can use it as a form of sonar. That's because their middle ear structure is entirely different. So if this is real, we should be able to look at the middle ear structure of these fossils and see intermediate forms in which they're reshaped. And you know what? That's exactly what we see. This is a paper a year and a half ago from Nature dissecting a series of fossil skulls and showing exactly how the apparatus in the middle ear was remodeled through a whole series of intermediate forms to change from an apparatus that was good for hearing in the air to an apparatus that was intermediate to an apparatus that was terrific for hearing under the water. So the fossil record, the more we fill it in, the more complete it becomes and the more powerful it becomes as evidence for evolution. The second thing that you saw at the trial was that when data was introduced at the trial, which I and another witness introduced from whole genome sequencing, the intelligent design advocates just literally had nothing to say. We weren't asked questions in cross-examination. The other side never brought it up. They never argued against it. They just left it. Here's an example. Um, many of you may know that a few months ago, the genetic code of the chimpanzee was published. Therefore, we can compare our genome to these primate relatives. What do we find? I want to show you one striking finding that dates to about a year ago. You all know that evolution argues that we share a common ancestor with the great apes, the chimpanzee, the gorilla, and the orangutan. Well, if that's true, there should be genetic similarities, and in fact, there are. 
But there's something that's really interesting and has the potential, if it were true, to contradict evolutionary common ancestry. And that is, we have two fewer chromosomes than the other great apes. We have 46, they all have 48. That's very interesting. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, um, the 46 chromosomes that we have, you got 23 from mom and 23 from dad. So it's actually 23 pairs. These guys have 24 from each parent, so they have 24 pairs. So everybody in this room is missing a pair of chromosomes. Now, where did it go? Could it have gotten lost in our lineage? Uh-uh. If it got lost, if a whole primate chromosome was lost, that would be lethal. So there's only two possibilities. And that is, if these guys really share a common ancestor, that ancestor either had 48 chromosomes or 46. Now, if it had 48, 24 pairs, which is probably true, because three out of four have 48 chromosomes, what must have happened is that one pair of chromosomes must have gotten fused. So we should be able to look at our genome and discover that one of our chromosomes resulted from the fusion of two primate chromosomes. So we should be able to look around our genome. And you know what? If we don't find it, evolution is wrong. We don't share a common ancestor. So if, how would we find it? Well, biologists in the room will know that chromosomes have nifty little markers. They have markers called centromeres, which are DNA sequences that are used to separate them during mitosis, and they have cool little DNA sequences on the end called telomeres. What would happen if a pair of chromosomes got fused? Well, what would happen is the fusion would put telomeres where they don't belong in the center of the chromosome, and the resulting fused chromosome should actually have two centromeres. One of them might become inactivated, but nonetheless, it should still be there. So we can scan our genome, and you know what? If we don't find that chromosome, evolution's in trouble. Well, guess what? It's chromosome number two. Our chromosome number two was formed by the fusion of two primate chromosomes. Uh, this is the paper from Nature a little more than a year ago. And I put up a little of the paper. I'm sorry it's technical, but look at what it says. Chromosome two is unique to our lineage. It emerged as a result of the head-to-head -head fusion of two chromosomes that remain separate in other primates. Those of you who have not kept up with how much we know about the genome uh, should pay attention to this, because you'll be amazed at how precisely we can look at things. The precise fusion site has been located at base number 114,455,823, 214 million 455 838. In other words, within 15 bases. And you'll notice multiple subtelomeric duplications, the telomeres that don't belong. And lo and behold, um, the centromere that is inactivated corresponds to chimp chromosome 13. It's there, it's testable, it confirms the prediction of evolution. How would intelligent design explain this? Only one way by shrugging and saying, that's the way the designer made it. No reason. No rhyme. Presumably, there's a designer who designed human chromosome number two to make it look as if it was formed by the fusion from a private ancestor. Um, I'm a Roman Catholic. I'm a theist. In, in the broadest sense, I would say I believe in a designer. But you know what? I don't believe in a deceptive one. I don't believe in one who would do this to try to fool us. And therefore, I think this is authentic. And it tells us something about our ancestry. Third thing that was abundantly clear at the trial, these great icons of intelligent design, the things that are supposedly unevolvable, they've fallen apart. Example, specifically taken apart at the trial, the notion that the bacterial flagellum couldn't have been produced by evolution, or the blood clotting cascade, or the generation of biological information. I don't have time to talk about all three, but I'm going to show you two of them. Um, the notion that these complicated biochemical structures couldn't have been produced by evolution, has been championed by Michael Behe. And Behe has an idea that he calls irreducible complexity. And he says, you can't evolve these things because they're irreducibly complex. Notice what he says. An irreducibly complex system can't be produced the way that evolution works, by numerous successive slight modifications of a precursor system, because any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. These are multi-part systems. And he's basically telling you that the 30 or 40 proteins that are in here, they all have to be together or there's no function. And since natural selection does have to work gradually, I agree on that point, um, it can't produce 20, 25, 26 proteins knowing what will eventually happen because natural selection is blind, which is indeed absolutely true. So the poster child 
for intelligent design by any standard, it shows up so often, it really could be called the poster child, is in fact the bacterial flagellum. This was mentioned so often in the trial that the judge, uh, probably from fatigue, got a little sarcastic about it. One of the attorneys said, Your Honor, when we reconvene, we're going to talk again about the bacterial flagellum. And the judge at one point said, Oh, goody. Um, <laughs> the last expert witness for the Board of Education, a biochemist named Scott Minnick from the University of Idaho, was called up to the stands to talk about this. And since Behe had talked about it, and the lawyers had talked about it, and they had argued about it, and I had talked about it, as I'm going to show you here for a second, Minich got up there, and he said he was going to talk about the bacterial flagellum, and the judge, uh, the judge deadpan, well, we've heard that before, and Minick turned to him, this is the best line of the trial, Minick turned to him and said, you know, Your Honor, I sort of feel like Zsa, Zsa Gabor's fifth husband. I know what to do, I just don't know how to make it exciting. Um, and uh, so I, I take my hat off to Scott. That was good. I like that. Um, so what, what is this argument about? Here, here's the argument in very simplified form. Um, if you have a complex, multi-part biochemical machine composed of many parts, its function, everyone agrees, can be favored by natural selection. But the argument is that evolution can't produce them because the individual parts have no function of their own. That's what irreducible complexity means. So natural selection can't make this, doesn't have any function. Can't make that, can't make that. Um, therefore, you can't evolve a structure like this. Now, how does evolution explain something like that? Well, ever since Darwin, we've had a very good explanation. Um, and that is these complicated machines, they don't arise from scratch. They arise from combinations of components that have different functions, functions of their own. And the components originate with functions of their own as well. Therefore, natural selection will work every step of the way. Now, that's not evidence. That's just an argument. But the beauty of this is we can now hold these two ideas up against each other. And we can say, who's right? If irreducible complexity is right, then the parts of these machines should be absolutely useless. But if evolution is right, we should be able to take these machines, look at their parts, and discover, wow, they do other jobs. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's take the bacterial flagellum. So if we start with the flagellum, here it is, and these drawings name the genes and the proteins in the flagellum, and we say, let's take away a whole bunch of the parts. How many? Um, not one, not five, not 10. Let's take 40 of its 50 parts away. Now watch very carefully, because I'm going to do that experiment right there. There it goes. The parts are all gone, and I have left 10 parts that span the membrane. What are left behind are 10 proteins in the base of the flagellum. Now, if irreducible complexity is right, this should be absolutely functionless. It should have no function. But if you'll pardon the double negative, what is left behind is not non-functional. What is left behind is the type 3 secretory system, and it is fully functional. I know most of you in the room are going, of course, the type 3 secretory system. <laughs> the type 3 secretory system is a molecular syringe in which some of the nastiest protein uh, 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 bacteria on this planet produce toxic proteins, grab onto one of our cells, and inject those proteins into our cells. The bacterium that causes bubonic plague works this way. It's really nasty stuff. Well, guess what? The 10 proteins that make up the type 3 secretory system are directly homologous to the 10 proteins in the base of the bacterial flagellum. They don't produce movement. They're not a flagellum. But are they functional? They are fully functional. So remember that claim. Any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. This guy is missing 40 parts and it is perfectly functional. What that means, there's no other word for it, is that that statement is wrong. Now that's not an incidental statement. That is the heart and soul of the intelligent design argument. And in this case, it turns out to be wrong. Now it's even wronger than that because it turns out that not only do these proteins make up the type 3 secretory apparatus, but almost every protein in the bacterial flagellum is strongly homologous to proteins that have other functions elsewhere in the cell. And what that means is when we look at this wonderful icon of intelligent design, a careful analysis of the flagellum actually matches evolutionary theory, namely the parts should have functions of their own and not the intelligent design prediction. And that's simply a fact. Now, intelligent design does no better when it talks about blood clotting. 
Um, I'm sure you all know that blood can clot, and many of you who have had the misfortune to take biochemistry as a college course also know that there is a complicated pathway of proteins that is responsible for blood clotting. Dr. Behe argues, and Intelligent Design argues, that pathway is irreducibly complex. And again, what does he mean? None of these proteins do anything except clot. In the absence of any of them, blood does not clot and the system fails. So the argument is the reason we know a creator had to create it or design it is because all the parts have to be present together. And the reason we know that is in the absence of any of the components, blood doesn't clot and the system fails. Now this is an argument made by Michael Behe, but it's also an argument that the Dover Board of Education wanted to present to their students. They got a copy, they got 60 copies, two classroom sets of this intelligent design textbook, Pandas and People. Pandas and People makes the exact same claim only when all the components are present does the system function properly, even though, uh, and us nasty evolutionary biologists point out, that all of these proteins, are almost all of them are serine proteases, which means they were probably formed by successive rounds of gene duplication. But once again, they say all the proteins, no, nothing, unequ nothing equivocal here, all the proteins have to be present simultaneously for the clotting system to function. That's very interesting. Being an empirical scientist, I always want to say, is that right? Well, how could we test it? We could test it by taking this wonderfully complicated system and let's take a component away. Let's knock one out and see if they're right. Well, the first one that we can knock out, because nature's done the experiment for us, is factor 12. Um, what happens if we knock out factor 12? Another PowerPoint experiment, there it goes. Factor 12 is gone. Will blood still clot? Well, not in us, but it turns out that whales and dolphins lack factor 12. It's actually an evolutionary adaptation to deep sea diving, and their blood clots just fine. That means that proposition that they all have to be present is wrong. Now, taking one away, that's kind of chintzy. Take, take a few more than one away. Okay, fair enough. Um, how about we take three of these factors away? Well, it turns out the puffer fish, a genome that was sequenced just a couple years ago, is missing the entire three-part contact phase system up there. The puffer fish has blood that clots just fine. So this argument about unevolvability, which is based basically on the argument that all the parts have to be present, it just turns out to be wrong. It falls apart, and this was something else that showed up in the trial. Um, this is technical information, but it basically shows that Doolittle has worked out an evolutionary scheme for how all of the factors evolved from a single set of components that existed before blood clotting was evolved, and that leads to an evolutionary prediction. And the evolutionary prediction is shown over here and over here in another paper. And that is that the protein should have very specific relationships to each other, the different factors. And lo and behold, you can search the genomes of a host of organisms, and it does exactly that. The relationships match. So what this means with respect to blood clotting is claims that you need every component to be present for biological function. That's the claim. Those claims are false. The second thing is a testable pathway has been proposed. I showed it on the previous slide. Careful analysis of that pathway shows it fits the evolutionary prediction, and there's absolutely no scientific support at all for any suggestion that the pathway was produced in a single step of creation or design. And that's what I mean by the collapse of the intelligent design as a scientific theory. Now, the one thing that I haven't shown you, because here I'm just going to read you part of the judge's decision, was a similar demonstration on the evolution of the immune system. And Behe has written, and it's part of in Pandas, that Darwinian explanations of the evolution of the, the immune system are hopeless and doomed to failure. Well, he wrote that about 10 years ago. And it turns out, as I described in my testimony, a flurry of research has shown exactly how the gene shuffling system in the immune system did evolve. And the judge captured this perfectly in terms of what happened on trial. On cross-examination, Professor Behe was questioned about this claim that science would never find an evolutionary explanation for the immune system. He was presented with 58 peer-reviewed publications, nine books, and several immunology textbook chapters about the evolution of the immune system. However, he ignored all this and simply insisted that it still wasn't sufficient evidence of evolution and that it was simply not good enough. And the, 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 if you want theater in the courtroom, what the lawyer did was held up the first paper, have you read it? He said no. 
This is a paper on the evolution of the immune system. Here's the second paper. Have you read that? Yeah, I read that one, uh, so forth and so on. And gradually, all 56 papers were piled up in front of the witnesses. A witness, all nine books, and all of these textbooks, and he simply said, it's evidence that is not good enough for me. I think that made a very strong impression on the judge that here was someone who, regardless of scientific credentials, was determined to ignore the empirical evidence rather than to go by it. 